Welcome to CIHT Podcasts. Hello, I'm Ginny Clark, the Chair of the Learning Society and Technical Strategy Board, and I wanted to tell you about a report that's just been published by CIHT. Improving Local Highways, the Route to a Better Future brings together two years' work by members of CIHT based on information collected from within the membership, local highway authorities and other organisations about the state of local highways. This has been done in the same timescale as the Transport Select Committee, who reported on their findings in the middle of last year. The difference about CIHT's work is that over, as I say, a period of about two years, we've consulted with local highway authorities and with other organisations about the key things that we ought to be asking of government. There are four key areas that we have identified in the report. The creation of a local highway network to sit alongside a major road network and a strategic road network. The second is to look at an inflation linked roads fund. Thirdly, to look at improving the data around the asset condition. And fourthly, it is to look at new areas of funding to support this local roads fund that we're recommending. These four key areas are things that we have already talk, spoken to government about in preparation for the budget that was recently announced. We will also be using this information for any future government consultation, including a possible comprehensive spending review. This report has a lot of interesting information in there and I encourage you to read it. It will be the basis for CIHT's contributions, as I say, to future government consultations and other publications where CIHT can add its views. I'd like to thank all those who've taken part in the study, whether it, as CIHT members, local highway authorities or through other organisations. And I would encourage you all to read the report. Thank you. I'm delighted that I'm joined by four experts in the sector. We've got Andrew Hugel, the Director of Policy and Technical Affairs at CHT, Steve Gooding, the Director of the REC Foundation, Matthew Lugg, former President of CHT, Expert in Asset Management and Head of Profession at WSP, and Michael Dowd Jones, Strategic Commissioning Lead at Somerset Council. So I'll turn to Andrew Hugel on the first question. The CHT review outlined the need for a new focus for the local highway network. Why did CHT see a need for this and why is it particularly important to events today? OK, thanks, Justin. I, I think all of us who took part in the review and, and all the people we spoke to recognise that the importance of the local highways network, and that's not just in vehicular terms, but it actually underpins everything that happens in this country and is used and depended on by everybody in this country. I think there was a, a feeling in the review and, and has been for some time, not just in CIHT, but actually local highways tends to be dominated by um, the needs of people driving vehicles. And I think the review felt that now was the time, particularly when the, uh, the, when the review was done, but ever increasingly so since the, the current situation has risen, we need to think about it in a much broader sense. We need to think about how the network allows for the movement and connection of people and goods in all sorts of ways, whether then they're not actually using it on a day to day basis. They almost certainly depend on it for the services that travel across it and also the services contained within it. So that that wide importance, I think, was the focus for why we needed a, a new thinking about the local highways network. And I think that that came out in a number of areas. I think clearly the whole issue around carbon and climate change was in our minds at the time. I think the need for places to be resilient was there at the time we were thinking about this review. That's something that's become ever increasingly more important and absolutely obvious. I think that the local highways network needs to, to cater for a whole host of things. And I think now when we're, we're thinking about how we move to active travel in a way that we haven't envisaged taking place as quickly as it has done, 
the need just to think about how the local network therefore works. So there was a number of areas we looked at. I think some thinking is needed about how we define how local highways meet the, those economic and social requirements. And we, we propose some sort of different ways of thinking about that for different parts of the network. So roads for places where the needs of specific places where highways pass through were, were thought of much more widely. That, that fits in very well with work we'd done around creating better streets when we were looking at shared space, the need for spaces to be inclusive. How we distribute goods and services along the highways needed maybe to be a, a special category. How we need highways to access places, both in terms of things like railway stations, um, places of work, everything that people need to get to, whether in vehicles or not. And also specific highways for sustainable and active transport, which is clearly at the fore at the moment. And I think that means not so much a reclassification, but actually a way we think about. So if we think about it in that way, what do those highways need to have? And they might need different things. So they might need better footways. They might need better surfacing. They might need better lighting. They might need a focus on removing congestion in certain places. So really, we felt now was the time to to start that thinking. And alongside that is is all to think about how the legislation and the regulations that are appropriate to the local highway network of whether they're fit for purpose at the moment, whether we need to change them. So a really broad area, but we felt it was something we really needed to focus on with with government and others. And that was the, the reason for the recommendations. And part of delivering those aspirations for the local highway network means that there needs to be sufficient resources to do that. And the second major recommendation was on the need to commit to establishing an inflation linked local highways fund. And the review identified a figure of 15 billion, which covered both revenue and capital. Mike, could I turn to you to explain why funding, particularly from a local authority perspective, is so essential? Yeah, thanks, Justin. And I mean, this follows on from what Andrew was saying in that um, local highway authorities are responsible for ensuring the local highway network remains fit for purpose and in a, a good and steady state of repair as one of our fundamental um, objectives. And, and uh, you know, Andrew's really described well how the network's essential in connecting our communities so people can access the goods and, and basic services they need to. And it's really central to keeping our economy going so that people can access learning and jobs and so that businesses can function essentially. All journeys start and end on the local highway network so it, it really is very important and it also enables people to stay physically active through walking and cycling in their local area which has got major benefits for, for health and well-being and that's been particularly important I think in the last few months as people have started to, um, to use the, the local highway network in different ways whilst they've had the opportunity and also the the network it hosts the technology that enables us to communicate through broadband links etc and will enable a rollout of new communication networks and to be central to to building new technology linkages going forward so it's really important part of of society so funding that obviously is 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 critical and, and funding that appropriately so there is a large maintenance backlog across the country on local roads and i think simply fixing potholes is a reactive and, and costly approach to things. Some asset types have been neglected really to the point at which traffic's actually restricted from using them, using parts of the network. So where the bridges need strengthening, et cetera, often there are, there are bans in place for certain types of traffic. And there are widespread renewals needed on certain asset types like street lighting columns and, and traffic signals. And thinking about sustainability, areas such as footway and cycleway maintenance have particularly suffered through this underinvestment, which tends to focus on carriageway um, maintenance. So it, it does really undermine our efforts to promote sustainable travel in the light of the, the climate emergency. So what we need really is a, you know, a long term 10 year funding commitment so that we can plan much further ahead uh, with certainty and invest in bringing the assets into a good and steady state of repair so that we avoid ad hoc and, and reactive expensive maintenance. So we can then, if we had a longer term plan, we can plan repairs and renewals at the appropriate point in the asset 
life cycle rather than letting things deteriorate to a point at which costs start to spiral. So long term funding certainty would would also let us put in place cost effective and predictable contracts for delivery of work programmes. You know, currently government tends to drop in extra top ups to budgets which are quite unpredictable and and that last minute approach does tend to inflate prices you know with, with contractors having to mobilize at short notice and actually leads to some very short term investment decisions about where that money goes and what it's spent on and part of what the government does currently as well is is have competitions for funding so there are challenge fund bids which again lead to uncertainty around whether funds will be available and, and for what so that that wastes quite a considerable amount of local authority resource in bidding and and government resource in, as well in, in terms of evaluating bids the other point i want to make is that local authority revenue budgets are, are really massively stretched and reduced revenue funding settlements have have been in place for a number of years there are increased cost pressures in other areas such as in adults and children's social care, which have significantly reduced the amount of money that most authorities are able to spend on on highway maintenance and, and routine stuff like weeding, uh, gully emptying and grass cutting. So this is obviously sort of starting to undermine the structural integrity of the highway because we're not able to do as much routine work as we used to be able to. So really, when you wrap all that up, what we need is an en enhanced investment for the long term. We need to ensure that both the routine revenue funded activity and the capital structural maintenance is properly funded through through a ring fenced TOTEX grants in the same way that the strategic road network is for, for Highways England. And CIHT has calculated through the review that 15 billion over 10 years would address the backlog and enable the wider set of asset types, not just carriageway condition, but you know that wider set of, of kit on the highway to be maintained in a steady state of repair and in a more predictable and cost effective way. So really important stuff and you know that long term approach is, is going to be essential going forward. And part of this will involve longer funding will require good asset management. Matthew, I was going to ask you as former chair of the UK Roads Board, you're also the lead on the Highway Maintenance Efficiency Programme, conduct a number of major reviews during the time on there was the potholes review, there was lots of procurement, there was a, a huge amount of useful resources through HMEP. So what new thinking does CHT bring to the recommendation on the need to create a better understanding of the asset through improved data? Just wanted to build on um, what Mike's been saying and recognising, you know, I think the, this review came at the right time because we recognised that the condition of the local road network had reached an all-time low. We had a, another bad winter of um, severe freeze-thaw damage, a pothole epidemic, problems at a national and local level um, in terms of the um, criticism of uh, the condition of local roads. So it was that we were able to galvanise the support needed to take a comprehensive view of, of what we needed to go forward. And I think it's really good that that timing fitted in with the, the uh, select committee review into uh, highway maintenance. And I know they made quite a lot of reference to the work of CIHT. And I'm pleased, uh, you know, since the publication of the report, it seems that government have also picked up on a lot of the advice that's in the report. So I think, you know, it is an important piece of work. But going back to the, the question, Justin, about data, yeah, clearly the importance of having good information is absolutely crucial at a local and national level in terms of our ability to effectively know what levels of investment to resource. And I suppose it's a bit of an old adage, but if we've got no idea of what we've got and what condition it's in, then how are we going to know what's actually needed to maintain it? So uh, one of the things we did as part of the, um, uh, the report was undertake a survey, and we did that across a number of issues, but we did it around um, the, the uh, availability of information for local authorities. And I suppose it sort of con confirmed a lot of what we suspected, that there's some bits of the asset we had good condition like carriageway, but there were other parts of the asset base that we didn't have good condition. Things like the unclassified road network, footways, cycleways and drainage. And I think if you think of the context of each of those in terms of what's needed, the unclassified network represents probably 60 or 70 percent of local roads in this country. And we've already mentioned about the issues of uh, importance of active travel in terms of footways and cycleways and the need to maintain, invest in them. 
and then off another severe weather event the the severe floods we had this winter the importance of having good data around drainage assets is, is also absolutely essential i think we all know where the gullies are but we do not know where the, the pipes that drain those gullies go in terms of outfall and whether they're well maintained or not so there is a big gap at a national level in understanding this asset base and I suppose, you know, going back to you mentioned UK Roads Board and maybe days when I was in County Surveyor Society, we did have a good handle on this through a thing called the National Road Maintenance Conditions Survey. And that was picked up by government and collected as national statistics. And in 2010, we lost a lot of that to the extent now uh, where we just don't have that information at a national level. And if we want to make sure we invest properly, we need that data to know what the condition of that asset is and how much it is to bring it up to a reasonable standard. So, um, you know, th those things are really important. Um, so, um, you know, the other aspect around this is, is recognising the report reflects on that actually the cost of collecting this asset isn't quite as it used to be because there's a lot of new technology available in terms of how data can be collected, whether that's through video surveys where, you know, it can all automatically be picked up uh, through those systems or remote sensors in terms of monitoring condition. So this isn't, you know, a, a bigger issue as it might be in terms of concern from local authorities about collecting that data. I think the other thing is we want the government to provide consistent uh, advice about the standard of that data so that when we try and calculate the overall cost like the national backlog we're not all coming up with numbers that are different in terms of how we calculate it so although the alarm survey is very good at um, tracking over a number of years the basis of the calculation is questionable because it's not calculated on a consistent basis so again having better information about you know what what the standards should be in terms of the specification for that data i think would help us get a better handle on the cost of all the highway infrastructure assets excellent so it's about taking advantage of the technologies that are there and the sort of change in that and the other shift we're seeing i guess on the transport networks at the moment is the shift is still at low levels in this country but certainly if you look at norway the uptake of electric vehicles indicates a shift in the nature of the, the vehicles that are driving on the, the local road network and then also on the national network. And that has an implication in terms of money for paying for roads, because if you're not getting the fuel duty and getting the taxation from, from petrol and so on. And Steve Gooding, I know that the RAC Foundation worked closely with Gary Rakuja on the Wilson Prize looking at how we pay for roads, paying for road use could be miles better. And also in the CHT report, there was they identified opportunities around road pricing to address congestion and reduce carbon and also provide a potential funding source. But we still seem a long way away from that. Where do you think we're at the moment? Where do you think government thinking is? And do you think it's now time to radically rethink how we pay for roads? My suspicion is that people in, well, I say in virtually in the Treasury at the moment, almost certainly are thinking about this. I'm pretty sure that the government's front of mind top priority is going to be getting the economy restarted. And I think one of the trickiest aspects of thinking about alternative funding sources, as the report does, is that just at the moment, we're all feeling pretty fragile. Business is feeling fragile, so a local authority dependence on business rates to plug the gap from revenue support grant. Well, that's looking dodgy. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen to our town and city centre businesses. We don't know a whole bunch of things. So I think that I don't, I don't think there's a simple way out of this, but I do think that from where we are now, now isn't a bad time to be thinking radical thoughts. So we've had some very radical government action in the last 12 weeks. Who would have thought that a Conservative Chancellor would have been stepping into the economy on the scale that Rishi uh, Sunak has had to uh, and has been willing to? Uh, who would have thought the government would be willing to contemplate some of the measures it's taken and is still suggesting it might take in future weeks? So if there's ever a time for radical thinking about doing something differently, then this is probably it quite what that shape should be well i'll take you back you referenced it the report that uh, gary richard uh, won the wolfson prize with which we were very happy to help out with 
took as its guiding principle one thing, and I'm pretty confident it's the one thing that made it win. And that is start with the simplest possible approach you can think of. The thing about paying taxes, we all pay our taxes. I don't know how often others on the uh, this uh, web conference think about it. I don't think about it all that much. I don't want to think about paying tax. I don't want to think about it any more than I absolutely have to. So any scheme under which people are starting to pay, perhaps if they're paying for a product, things are different. But if what they're really doing is paying money into the exchequer so the chancellor can decide what to do with it, it needs to be boring. And I, I think that where we came out on the Wolfson Prize project was to say, just start with new vehicles. Don't try and retrofit the fleet. Start with new vehicles. Start with a simple pay as you go distance charge, which is very akin to the idea of, of paying fuel duty, because the more you drive, the more you're going to be paying. Make that work. There are all sorts of tunes you can pay on that in due course. But if you start thinking about that now, you can start thinking about how that would work for the drivers of plug in electric vehicles. And you've mentioned their take up. It's quite clear that in the last in the last two weeks, even the government has been sig signaling moves to rapidly accelerate the take up of electric vehicles. If only the industry can produce the vehicles in sufficient numbers for us to buy. Um, these vehicles are not going to pay any fuel duty. Just by definition, they're electric. So what are they going to pay? Are we going to carry on a system where road use comes at some price to the exchequer? If so, is there a simpler, fairer way of doing that than imposing a charge by distance? We couldn't think of one. And we did come up with the idea that in addition to perhaps paying simply by reference to the reading of your odometer in the car, that if you were party to a pay-as-you-go scheme of some sort, like pay-as-you-go insurance, or perhaps a pay-as-you-go in the way that you're paying for the vehicle, that the payment for the distance you drive could be fed through that system. One of the great advantages of fuel duty, and almost every tax we could think of, uh, is that it's a percentage of something else. It's a percentage of a flow. There's a system there that's all ready to collect it. And one of the big problems historically we've had with all of the academic thinking about road pricing is it's great in theory, but it's replacing something which has literally got the lowest cost of collection of any tax anyone has ever invented, which is fuel duty. And that's going to be tough. So long answer to a short question. Yes, now is a good time to be thinking radically. Is there anything else that was in the review that would be worth highlighting? Or is can I just move to a close on that as welcome any thoughts or anything you want to chip in on other bits i might have missed it apologies but um i thought the I th it might have been sorry it might have been in what andrew said but pulling out the stuff that was in the report about defining what the roads are for having some sort of performance measures new performance measures i thought was quite an important part of the story and apologies like i said if someone's already covered that in what they said but um, I think it'd be a pity not to mention that. I probably st skirted over that, Steve, so it's probably worth just saying it again, is I think there's there's part of the sort of recommendations were, were clear about the, the new focus was that people, however they're using the, the network, understand what the network is there for and what the, if you like, the offer is to people. Um, so if, if if we're splitting the network into different sort of types that people understand that. So um, and it links to sort of Matthew's point about having the data. And I think moving towards a sort of performance type specification so that people are clear what they're getting for their money, as it were, whether that's coming through general taxation or through specific sort of charging for use, as it were. I think that needs to be linked to to what people can expect, because actually from a council's point of view as the um, in the local highways network, as the, as the people responsible for that, I think there's a sort of there's probably a bit of a disconnect at the moment in, in how things work in that they're they're responsible for spending money to do things through a quite a complex political process without any sort of rationale for doing that. And I think if, if, we, if we're asking people to pay in the simplest way 
for usage via vehicle usage, um, they probably, it's not unreasonable. They understand what they're getting for that money. And therefore, you link that to the performance of, of, of what it is we decide that performance should be. And that might be different in different parts of the network. It might be about sort of lack of congestion. It might be about the quality of the road surface. It might be the access that, that others have to it. So there's there's quite a bit of work needs to be done around that. But you can only do that where you've got the data to, to think that through. So I think that's a, a really important part of what came out. This, this isn't just about sort of putting different names to different parts of the network. It's how people view the network. And I think there's lessons from a number of areas that sort of sort of bring that out that, that, that have been trialed in the past and, and do work to some extent. It's how we roll that out on a sort of wider basis. Matthew, you've got sort of past experience in this area. If you've got views on this, just to sort of add to what's been said by Andrew. Yeah, again, I you know, support what Andrew says. And I think that, you know, there's a real opportunity here because the self-assessment process I wrote for DFT is was always going to be a five-year process and this year was the last one and the good news is that 90, 98% of highway authorities have achieved band three status which is the highest level and to maximize their funding in this area so I suppose you know now we've hit that level it's where do we go to next and I think you know the report does allude to some of the thinking around that in terms of looking at you know what sort of outcome uh, a local authority is going to uh, or should they expect to achieve with the extra funding that they they, they hopefully are going to are going to be paid and that we've already seen you know some of that money coming through and I think that's important in terms of uh, what happens in a spending review discussion around extra investment treasury will want to see that you know this money is spent efficiently effectively rather than just handing it over to local government has been the case up to now you know there should be some degree of accountability and we talked in the report about maybe some sort of monitoring and stewardship around making sure that that funding is spent effectively so yeah i think there is um you know the timing is right now to to, to develop that thinking and talk about what could replace the incentive fund to help further drive efficiency and effectiveness particularly when um you know local authorities are going to be having additional funding you know it's really important that it's spent appropriately well thank you for your time today that was andrew hugel matthew lug mike dad jones and steve gooding looking at a continuity of thinking and also a degree of radical thinking i think 